Sorry about that. I need to unmute. Yes, here we go. Thank you for the talk. That was really good. Thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad you thought so. Yeah, it was really good. And um, so we will be taking uh, questions. Uh, I do understand there is a two minute lag. We did have a couple questions come in. So I'm going to um, go ahead and uh, put those up on the screen. And then um, you guys just send in your questions and we will get to them. Um, so the first question is from Stephanie and she asks, with the easier PSQI, you indicated that you must request to use the scale from PIT. With the easier scoring format, which is a Google Drive doc versus the PIT, EDU link, do you have to request to use this easier scaling document? Good question. Um, yes, it would be my, my answer for that uh, because it still is the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. Um, and and you're, it's, freely, it's free to use uh, for clinical purposes, even research purposes. It's just not intended to be used as like, you know, for commercial or for profit. Um, so the easy version, it's still the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. It's just been uh, reformatted and it has the scoring um, available on that form. Um, it used to be available on a, a link um, that, I, that was no longer available. So I dropped it into my Google Drive and, and, and have shared that. Um, but yes, technically you should um, ask for permission to use the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. Okay, and our next question comes from Jim. Um, and the uh, Q&A box does kind of cut off the few letters at the end. Um, he at, says, I've been told by the physicians in my area can only do sleep studies for suspected obstructive sleep apnea. They do not get reimbursed by insurance for any other type of sleep study. Is that a common practice? Huh. Um, that That's somewhat surprising. Um, I The neurologist that I work with, um, where I do my overnight sleep studies, um, she does overnight sleep studies for lots of different reasons. Um, I mean, obviously, obstructive sleep apnea is a very prevalent issue. Um, so she does see a lot of clients for obstructive sleep apnea, um, but uh, also for restless leg syndrome, periodic moon of sleep. Um, so that's that's somewhat confusing, I think, to, to say that, that he only does um, overnight studies for obstructive sleep apnea. Um, it is true that there are some reimbursement, uh, I guess, kind of, I don't want to say concerns, but the, the procedures you have to follow for reimbursement for like prescription of CPAP. Um, I wonder if, if maybe that's what he was referring to, uh, because oftentimes uh, they, uh, insurance will require that you actually do an in-home sleep study first. Um, and then if the in-home study shows that you have, without a doubt, or fairly confident that you have obstructive sleep apnea, then they go ahead and prescribe you a, a CPAP or BiPAP. Um, but if it's somewhat inconclusive, then you do an overnight sleep study uh, to diagnose uh, sleep apnea. Um, so, so sorry, I, that, that's, yeah, that's somewhat confusing on, on why they would only do the overnight sleep studies for sleep apnea, because there'd be other indications for why you would do overnight sleep studies. And uh, another question is from Adi, and she asks, what are your thoughts about sleeping pills? Um, you get asked that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm wondering if I go through my long spiel or my short spiel. Um, maybe I'll go somewhere in the middle. Um, I mean, I think I, I, my, my issue with sleeping pills is that they are way over prescribed. I'll just, I'm just going to say that and I'm going to throw that out there. Um, I think that uh, oftentimes when people do have insomnia, that that's, you know, what physicians, they give out. Um, but, but really, the recommendation um, for insomnia um, is to do CBTI. That is, that's the recommended first step uh, to treat insomnia. Now, that being said, there, there may be some people who, who for short term, maybe do need a sleep aid. Uh, in the in the short term, um, so absolutely, there's. I don't want to say there's no indication for sleeping pills at all, um, but what I oftentimes see in the clients that I work with is that once they're prescribed a sleep aid, they're on it for a long time, um, and we know mm -hmm. that they become less effective, uh, and they also they become a crutch. I mean, they become something where you know I've I've had people who are so worried at the idea of getting off of their sleeping pill because it's like if if I don't take this sleeping pill, then I will not sleep. And it's like, well, you know, let's experiment with this. Let's try this. Um, obviously, you, you came to see me, so you must be willing to try CBTI. 
Um, but, but, but there's so many people that get so concerned about staying on those sleeping pills. Um, so anyway, so I'll, I'll step off my soapbox, but they are, they are way, uh, over prescribed. And I, I'm certainly a big proponent of doing behavioral interventions, uh, because those are shown to be very effective. Okay. We actually have another question, um, coming in, uh, when practicing some of these sleep habit habits, these, this is from Joel, sorry. When practicing some of these sleep habits, what kind of timeline do you prepare patients for to see results a week, four weeks? That's a great question. Um, you know, and, 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 and like most intervention, it, it depends a lot. Um, the CBTI protocols that we do, uh, we do six weeks. Um, but I have some clients who, after I see them one time, they come back in a week later. And, and so we see them one time a week for six weeks. Um, they, they come in one time and I see them the next week and their sleep is dramatically better. Um, that's not uncommon. If they, uh, you know, so it, it kind of depends on what's the underlying issue contributing to their insomnia. That's the, that's the big key. You know, for some people, you know, like for an example, I had one person who uh, was having insomnia um, and she was checking her work email right before bed. Um, and so, of course, you know, checking the work email, I suspect she probably was doing other things on her phone as well. Um, so she was spending more time on the phone. And then, of course, the content of thinking about work then right before bed was, you know, disrupting her ability to fall asleep. Um, so we did a behavioral experiment where she experimented with not getting on her phone right before bed. And with the next week, her sleep was dramatically better. Um, and then there's, there's other people who have, um, you know, some, some other, I think, more complex issues underlying their sleep issues. Um, so for people who, uh, you know, do have persistent pain, um, you know, that can be a, a, a big difficulty um, for people who have become anxious about their sleep, um, which again, for a lot of people who we see, they've had sleep issues for years. Uh, so a lot of people we work with are, are pretty anxious and uh, concerned about their sleep. Uh, for so, so for some of those people, it can take a little bit more time uh, because of how we introduce the relaxation techniques. And of course, it just takes some time to practice those relaxation techniques. Um, but I will say for the clients that are very adherent with a regular wake up time, um, and they're very adherent with stimulus control. Those are the people that um, have much quicker results than the people who um, are less adherent or who have much more difficulty with doing those kind of big tenets of CBTI. All right, and we have time for just one last question here um, before we end the Q&A. And this one's from Justin. And he asks, even though commercially available sleep trackers aren't too accurate, are they helpful at all when looking for trend improvements? Absolutely. And I, and I think that's a, a valid point, you know, because because no, we, we know that they're not very accurate, um, but there, there still are some benefits to them. And I will say that if you're using it like, you know, within the individual and looking at, you know, changes in their sleep over time, then then absolutely they can be useful. Um, you know, I, I just always couch it with, you know, just to be aware that this could be over underestimating or underestimating uh, your sleep uh, duration and quality. Um, so I, I tend to focus more on, you know, you know, how are they, you know, when they wake up, um, how would they, how would they rate their sleep quality versus the device? Um, but yeah, there's, there's definitely utility and especially for the people who really, you know, cause there's some people who are really, really interested in the data coming from their wearables. And so absolutely capitalize on their willingness to, you know, experiment with things and then see how it affects their sleep or their physical activity levels. Um, so yeah, there's definitely some good use of it as well. Cool. Well, um, thank you so much, Dr. Sayang Sukan. And for uh, the attendees who have purchased the backstage pass, you will be joining us in the Zoom discussion room that you received in your email this morning. 